Hey guys, Kathy Brooks here. I'm about 20 minutes late for my usual broadcast. Um, the Lyft driver decided to listen to their GPS instead of me. How irritating. Anyway, I'm on a, a brief trip out of town. I had some uh, clients to see here in the San Francisco Bay Area, so I've uh, scooted up over into the Bay to, uh, to check things out. Hey, Bridger, come on up. Bridger, come here. So I have my little pal Bridger here with me. And um, what we're talking about today is how to pick the right dog care solution. Last week, we talked about some uh, behaviors and things to think about with dogs as you are making your way back to work. So how do you find the right solution? How do you find the right caretaker? What does that look like? And, and, and how do you know when the fit is right? So the first and most important thing to know is your dog. Some dogs really love a lot of activity. Other dogs are a bit more sedentary. That's kind of a basic split. Some dogs really don't like being around a lot of other dogs. They might like a few dogs. Some dogs love being in large groups. Some dogs need a lot of mental activity. Some dogs need a lot of one-on-one -on -one care. Some dogs just shouldn't be in a group. Some dogs have high prey drive, so they need to be in groups that are isolated in terms of dogs of their own size. All of these things are important to know about your dog. And, and here's where I often uh, find one of the greatest challenges when I'm working with folks is, and I say this with the most uh, utmost of respect for, for pet owners out there, um, most of us are delusional about our own dogs. Now, even I, a trained professional, have to check myself when it comes to my dogs because even I, with my own dogs, can sometimes find those emotional blinders going on and not, not being pragmatic about the reality of my dog's behavior. So first and foremost, get real and hopefully you can find a professional who will help you get real about your dog. We all love our dogs. As far as we're concerned, our dogs can do no harm. They are loving, they are kind. Our dogs at home are one way, but this isn't about how your dog is at home. This is about how your dog is with a group of other dogs or with one other dog or with a trained professional. Hopefully in all of the cases with a trained professional. So in terms of looking at where you should be putting your dog. Again, first and foremost, really get clear. Now, part of your dog's behavior is just systemic to being a dog. Canis lupus familiaris, the domesticated canine. They live in groups. Those groups need hierarchy and rules. Uh, those groups have order and they have different games and engagements that they have among themselves to determine kind of the structure within the group. So that's first and foremost. Now, as we've talked about many times here on canine linguistics, at the end of the day, this breed, this species is one of the most man-made, if not the most man-made species in the world. We have selectively bred the canine for millennia and millennia, tens of thousands of years. We have selectively bred this species, creating particular breeds that were designed for particular work. Now, there are some people who say dogs are just small, medium, and large, that breed behavior has nothing to do with it. I don't personally believe that. Now, I don't believe that breed is the alpha to the omega, to use a phrase. I don't believe it defines the dog any more than my own genetic lineage defines who I become because I have free will, because I am an individual. But in the case of a canine, in the case of a dog, you have a situation where some breeds, uh, like the hunting breeds, the sporting breeds, the herding breeds, the terriers, uh, the other working dogs, dogs that were uh, bred to pull things or to retrieve things or to tear things apart, whatever that may be, the dogs were specifically designed for these purposes that resulted in differences in size, in certain physiological proportions of the dog, be it their jaw, be it long-legged, be it how their hips move, be it their speed, um, other characteristics like speed and agility, 
dogs that have a highly sensitized um, olfactory sense, you know, so the hounds, the scent hounds, the sight hounds, where their vision is super, super sharp and they kind of are, their attention gets pulled very quickly. All of these makeups, all of these things in the dog do give us an idea of the kind of behavior that the dog has, which means it helps us understand the kind of environment that might be most beneficial for the dog. So at the Hydrant Club, we are one large group. It's one mixed group, small to large. We have no breed restriction whatsoever, but we do have behavioral restriction. So we've had an occasion where there was a beautiful, very high drive, very prey oriented uh, young hunting dog. He was an adolescent hunting dog and he couldn't be in a space with the smaller dogs. It was unreasonable to expect that this dog could safely be in that space because at the end of the day, this dog was always going to be precisely and exactly who he is. Think of, for those of you who may know it, there's the parable of the scorpion and the swan. It's sometimes told as the scorpion and the frog. So you've got a scorpion and then you have some sort of water bird or amphibious creature that can be in the water. And you've got the scorpion who's alongside a river and pondering getting across because, you know, scorpions don't swim. So the scorpion waves over, we'll say it's a swan, waves the swan over and says, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you give me a lift? I need to get to the other side. The swan kind of paddles around and looks at the scorpion and says, no way. I'm not giving you a ride. The scorpion says, why not? The swan says, well, look, we're going to get halfway across the river. You're going to sting me and I'm going to die. So why would I give you a ride? So the scorpion pauses and says to the swan, now that is preposterous. If I sting you in the middle of the river and you sink, I can't swim, so I would die. Why would I do that to you? Why would I do that? The swan paddles around a little bit and ponders the answer, very, very logical, and says, you know what? You're absolutely right. Hop aboard, swims over to the edge, scorpion drop, you know, hops on, they're paddling across, they're talking about the weather, and all of a sudden, bam, scorpion stings the swan. Swan is, of course, very taken aback by this and says, as the swan is being succumbed by the venom and sinking under the water, says, what'd you do that for? Scorpion says, I can't help it. It's just what I do. So I share that because we can't hold dogs to unreasonable expectations. We have to understand what their behaviors are and put them into environments where they're going to be successful. Putting a very high drive dog that doesn't really have boundaries, that doesn't have strong recall, that has a very strong prey drive in a space where there are creatures that look like prey is to set that dog up to fail. Because when that dog does what that dog will do, the one who gets punished is the dog. When of course it's human error and human failure that allowed the dog to be in that space in the first place. Now there are exceptions to every rule. We have a Belgian Malinois, he's almost entirely Malinois, one eighth German Shepherd, I think, who comes to our group. Um, He has no drive really at all. Um, He failed out of Schutzen training. He sh- you know, he failed out of bite training miserably. Now, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have the Belgian Malinois brain, because he does, so he has to be kept busy, but he actually prefers the company of the smaller dogs, which is kind of hilarious. He is, however, a unicorn. He is not a typical Malinois by any stretch of the imagination. So understanding your dog, understanding the breed or breed makeup and what the dog is actually made for. Let's be clear, there's a lot of old wives tales or fairy tales and myths around what some breeds were made for, that there were breeds that were designed to be nannies and to babysit children. There's never been a time when a dog was a babysitter. Um, It's like putting a child in a stall with a horse. You might as well do the same thing. Dogs aren't babysitters of human children. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have great stories of heroism, of dogs seeing a baby fall in the pool and jump into the pool and save the baby, Um, all sorts of stories. But those are anecdotes. They're not data. They're not statistical. They're not every case. And so to assume that based on an anecdote that a dog is a certain way, again, is to set the dog up to fail. 
Okay, so we've talked about breeds, breed specificity, behaviors of breeds, what breeds were made for and why that matters. So now we need to think about the individual dog. So we have um, a dog who comes to us at the Hydrant Club who is a doodle, mid-sized doodle, um, kind of typical mid-sized doodle in all regards, except for the fact that this dog is among the most introverted dogs I've ever met. Doesn't really like being in large groups frequently, so can be in a large group occasionally. But if the dog is among uh, a high density group of other dogs, highly stimulated, for more than three or four days, the dog withdraws, gets very, very uncomfortable, can be a little snappy on occasion, and can in a moment go from nice dog to snapping and temper tantrum dog. So what do we do with a dog like that? So, well, the dog comes occasionally for daycare, gets its fill, but when the dog, for example, say boards with us and is with us for five or six days at a time, it's a dog who will be given breaks during the day, taken out of the group, taken for a one-on-one -on -one walk, taken in the back, given a nap time in the sleepover lounge, given the opportunity to get some space so that the dog can then re-enter the group and remain safe. Now, not every dog care facility would have uh, services like that or would customize service quite like that. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the point of this is to talk about dogs specific behavior as an individual. Just because I may be a very extroverted person that likes to be around a lot of people and likes to do a lot of stuff doesn't mean that my dog is that way. Now it's likely that my dog's behavior and temperament is quite aligned with mine, but it also d doesn't necessarily need to mean to need that need to mean that. So it's important again to look pragmatically at your dog's behavior and to really identify: Does your dog really like this? There was another occasion where someone brought their dog to us and really wanted their dog to come to daycare. The dog came, and I could tell the dog was very nervous, probably really introverted came for the interview. We did a couple of trial sessions. At the end of the two trial sessions, I said to the owner, I said, look, I think your dog would be happier at home with a walker who comes once, maybe twice a day, takes them out for a walk, maybe sits and watches TV with them for a while and leaves them alone. And they said, no, I want my dog to go to daycare. I want my dog to go to daycare. I want to bring my dog here three days a week. Now look, I'm a business owner. A dog coming to daycare three days a week, day school, three days a week is, that's good money for a business. But it's not about that, at least it shouldn't be. Because at the end of the day, that dog is not gonna be happy being put in a day school environment. Now, even if it were, say, brought to a facility where it were kenneled for most of the day and just put into groups a little bit, that could actually be more damaging to a dog that really is okay being at home. And if the owner's gonna work a long day, have someone go in the middle of the day, take the dog out for a 30 to 60 minute walk, get them some exercise, give them the stimulation they need, and then just let the dog be. Sometimes just because we want something for our dog doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right thing for the dog. So we have to put what we want out to the side a little bit and really think about the well-being of our little canine family members. Okay, so we've talked about knowing the breed and the breed specificity. We've talked about knowing your own dog and your own dog's needs. So now we get to the third part, which is as crucial. Uh, I put them in this order mostly because it scales nicely this way, but they are all of equal import. You must understand the breed and breed makeup. You must understand your dog. And finally, you need to figure out what kind of sources you want. So you've got dog walkers, some of those walkers take dogs out one-on-one -on -one or in very small groups. Some take large groups out. Some take large groups of dogs to public fenced in dog park spaces. So when you're seeking someone who's taking your dog from your home that way, you need to identify what kind of walker they are. What kind of place are they taking your dog? Is it hikes in the woods and into the mountains, if those are available where you live? Is it urban walking? Is it to a public dog park space? Is it to some sort of private dog park space? Will your dog be one-on-one -on -one with that person, with a small group if it, or a large group? If it's with a group, will it be with the same group all the time or will that group be mixed? 
How do they determine what dogs go in the, that group? What filtering process do they use? What screening and evaluation process to make sure that those groups of dogs are properly balanced? And finally, what's the skill set of the person who's actually taking your dog out? Are they licensed? Which means do they have a business license? Are they properly permitted with whatever animal welfare or animal care organization is in the area. Typically, dog care people need to have a business license, which is your operational license, and then some sort of dog handling, uh, dog fancier, professional dog permit, which allows them to be handling multiple dogs that don't belong to them. So does this in, how long has this individual been doing it? What kind of background do they have? What kind of experience do they have? Are they familiar with dog behaviors that they can manage the dog group safely? What kind of CPR or first aid skills do they have? And what relationships do they have with veterinarians and their ability to get your dog to a vet if your dog is injured while the group is out? If a dog is injured and goes to the vet, what happens to the rest of the dogs that are in that person's care? So those are the things to think about if you're talking about a dog walker. Now, if you're talking about a dog care facility, those break down into roughly, you know, your typical doggy daycare, which can be in someone's home. It can be at a facility. Um, the in-home, make sure the person has a legal permit and license to be operating what's described in most municipalities as a dog kennel, which means essentially four or more, in most places, four or more adult dogs being housed uh, for more than eight hours or especially overnight. So if it's a home-based business, make sure that they're legally operating and they have all the permits they need. This would include that they've been evaluated for things like security, that their fence is secure, that there aren't toxic materials anywhere nearby so that the pets are safe, that they have evacuation protocols, they have emergency protocols, all of those things. And that's if it's in a home. You also don't want a dog in a neighborhood where you know maybe other neighbor, the neighbors are gonna get ticked off. So that's if it's a home-based business. If your dog is going to a facility, then the question really becomes, okay, so my dog's in a facility. Is my dog crated, kenneled, or caged? If so, what does that containment space look like? Is my dog contained with other dogs or on its own? How often is my dog out of that containment space? How often are they in group? And again, just like with the walker, how are the groups filtered? How do they screen the dogs before entry to make sure that all the dogs that are involved in the group should be in there? If a dog has had an incident, do they allow that dog back in? Do they have any sort of strike policy? If a dog has an incident once, are they allowed a second incident? What kind of reporting structure do they have if an incident takes place? What kind of communication do they have with you, the owner, if something happens while the dog is in their care? What about emergency protocols? If something happens at the facility or maybe even just next door, how do they handle that? Do they have an emergency protocol? Do they have an evacuation protocol? And are they prepared to enact that protocol properly if something does happen? And finally, you know, do they have breed restrictions? You know, how do they manage those? Why do they manage those? What's the dog? I said finally, but I was lying because it wasn't finally. Um, what's the dog to handler ratio? Now, this is interesting because I've seen a couple of facilities that say our dog to handler ratio is this number to one, 10 dogs to one, 12 dogs to one. Here's the thing about a hard number. They're lying. There isn't a facility that I know of any credibility that has a hard, fast number related to a handler, and I'm going to tell you why. Because no group of dogs is the same. And even any one group of dogs from one, way to the, one day to the next isn't the same. So what does that mean? I could have 10 dogs and need three handlers. If half of those dogs or more are young, adolescent, high-drive dogs, I could have 18 dogs and one handler. If that handler is very, very senior and the dogs are older and maybe a little bit smaller. What most facilities that I know have as a mandate, and there are states where this is mandated by law, the ratio tends to be roughly 10 dog, 10 to 15 dogs as a range, 10 to 15 dogs per handler. Now, I think there should be some other qualifiers in that algorithm. First of all, the training of the staff. Again, just as no groups of dogs are the same, 
No two handlers are the same. Someone with three, five, 10 years of experience managing groups of dogs is vastly different than somebody who's been on the job for a month. So it's important to know how are those people trained? What is the process they go through? How soon is it before someone who's new is put in with a group of dogs and left there on their own? If my dogs are there, that's information that I sure wanna know. And then again, what kind of training protocols are they put through? So thinking about that ratio of the handler as well as then the makeup of the group is really, really important. Um, I know of a facility that um, tell, will tell if you call and you ask their dog to handler ratio, they'll say 20 to 25 dogs per handler. Now, I don't know how you feel about that number, but I'm a trained professional. I could probably handle 20 to, five, 25, 20 to 25 dogs. As a matter of fact, I know I could. I sure wouldn't want to do it with any sort of regularity. That's a ridiculously high number. It is very easy to miss things. And by miss things, I mean two dogs are playing, one dog nips another dog, and one of the dogs gets a cut on its side. It's a you know playground injury, but you don't see it happen. The dog's coat covers it up, and now the dog's shown up at home with an injury on its side, an injury that could have been cleaned up. And so that's really important to figure out. Uh, I forgot one qualifier in terms of the dog to handler ratio. The space in which the dogs are being held is also really important. If I have say 2000 square feet and I've got 15 dogs and one person, I'm probably okay. If I've got a half an acre or an acre and I've got 10 dogs, I better have more than one person. There's no physical way one person can manage that kind of space. So think about that when you're looking at the spaces as you go to visit and tour facilities, look at the spaces where the dogs are, look at the training and the handling techniques of the handlers. Do they have what looks like a utility, like a Batman utility belt with water bottles and all sorts of things hanging off of it? Or are they kind of streamlined and, you know, streamed down, um, in terms of the the things that they have on them. Um, I certainly don't want anyone using an air horn to break up any sort of dog activity. If my dog's in the group, that would be very upsetting to me as a dog parent. So these are really, really important factors to think about. So again, understanding breed and breed makeup um, in terms of the real, actual use of that breed Understanding that, of course, there is, you know, always wiggle room, a bit of wiggle room there. Understanding your dog and your dog's needs. And finally, really identifying the different kinds of spaces and how those spaces are managed and the protocols and procedures in those spaces. Picking a place to take care of your dog is a really important decision. It isn't a decision that should be taken lightly. Oh man, I can't even believe I I skipped health screening. So much for my nicely wrapped up conclusion. One more thing. What is the health screening protocol of the given facility? What vaccines do they require? What health requirements do they require a fecal test? Does it have to be a comprehensive fecal test or just a simple ova and parasite screen? Do they allow a fecal flotation as their um, verification that a fecal test is clear. How do they gather all of those records? Do they allow your dog to enter the facility before they even see the records? Got to tell you, if somebody's dog comes into a facility and that dog has Giardia and it goes to the bathroom in the lobby and they don't know that that dog has a positive Giardia screening because they haven't checked the records and your dog is the next one in the lobby, your dog may be the next dog that gets Giardia. So that's just an example of why you want to have a facility that gathers all of the records before they even let your dog enter, just to make sure that your dog meets their protocols. Okay, so like I said, we talked about breed and breed specificity. We talked about knowing your dog. We talked about all the various qualifications of a given facility. Making this choice is one that you shouldn't take lightly you should research, you should ask lots of questions. Um, You know, we do limited tours of our facility depending on when someone comes. Um, We don't typically do personally at the Hydrant Club informational 
tours anymore. We absolutely do. We'll do an informational interview, mostly because we're really metering the access of the facility. So by the time somebody has come with their dog, um, they've made the commitment to follow our COVID protocols as well, because we're really on lockdown to try to keep all of our clients, uh, our human clients safe as well. So I'm sorry I was late today. Hopefully you guys weren't waiting too long, but I'll be putting this to our Instagram story. I'll be placing it over on our Facebook page in its entirety as well. And um, I have no idea what I'm talking about next week. But for now, I'm Kathy Brooks for this week's Canine Linguistics. Thanks for tuning in. Stay safe, everybody.